Live loved, part three and final. Uh, may your eyes, ears, and heart hear you are loved. Because sometimes it takes seeing words that are true, hearing words, and then our soul, our heart, sensing, confirming what is true. Because when we say things of the love of God, they don't become true when we declare them. They're true already, and our hearts respond in kind. But today, I want to share some things that made me ponder and pause this week. And these ones are a little different. They're all right. I know I say that almost every week, but this is different. So I thought this was interesting. A fact is information minus emotion. An opinion is information plus experience. Ignorance is an opinion lacking information. And stupidity is an opinion that ignores a fact. Worth pondering, okay? That's all I'm saying. Next, this one's a deeper one. For those who are having a hard time, you cannot see the way out of a challenge if you are looking at it every day from the same level of mind, emotions, thoughts, and feelings of the past. Joe Dispenza. That's a really good line. You can oh, post these later. And then this one is in the same theme. If you continue to carry the bricks from your past, you'll end up building the same house. Very interesting. And lastly, on this theme, I love this from Kenneth Tanner. No matter the distance our hearts and minds sail from God, God is our stowaway. You can't run. You can't hide. Isn't that amazing? I love that. That was really cool. This is how you pray continually. Not by offering prayer in words, but by joining yourself to God through your whole way of life. So your life's become, so your life's become, becomes a continues, sorry, becomes a continuous and an uninterrupted prayer. This is a different way to experience prayer. Instead of trying to figure out, okay, I got to do, you know, uh, Thanksgiving first, then I got to do supplication, and I got, uh, like, that list that we have that we were taught. It can be great as a tutoring tool, but at some point, you got to stop being tutored. I said that out loud. Many people reject Jesus because of bad experiences with religious people. But here's the thing. Jesus had bad experiences with religious people too. In fact, they killed him. People will let you down. Jesus won't. How many times a week do I hear I'm not that religious or I don't believe in God anymore? And by the time the discussion gets going, they're always disbelieving an angry God. Something we're still unlearning here. All right? Really, really cool. Next. I love Thomas Merton. When I criticize the system, they think I criticize them. And that is, of course, because they fully accept the system and identify themselves with it. This is really important. Okay? The system of religiosity, the system of church. We're not talking about the church the church of Jesus, which is you and me. Not this location, not this building. The church is people. And we gather in different pockets and places, either coffee, a foursome golf, or having a great dinner, or help serve somewhere else. That's the church. We are the church. The system is not the church. We know that, right? I think we do. I love that. And this is a long time ago. I love this from Jeff Turner. I cut out his picture because this will make the words larger, but I'll post that later. My point is that Christ's primary concern was not for us to go into the world and warn them of a burning hell, but for us to take good news coupled with hope and healing to a harassed and helpless humanity. The world does not need a red-faced, angry preacher scolding them for their secret sins. They need a compassionate shepherd who will help to lead them out of the fog of confusion and pain that they live in constantly. The backbone of our message is not fear and terror, 
but freedom, hope, and healing. To miss this is to miss the gospel. That one hit me this week. I thought, okay. Do you know how you kind of know these things and suddenly somebody phrases it a little differently and it clicks one more click as if you have this big safe you're trying to open with many, many clicks? That's what it feels like when I hear different lenses and the way people phrase things. This past week I shared a video I did a long time ago on Still Growing Grace, but it was a message called The Gospel in Chairs. If you haven't had a chance to see it, please go see it. Because there's an illustration I've learned from a couple other people who have done it, and I thought I'm going to do it my way just to see if I can do this. And I ended up teaching it in Mexico every, uh, when we were on that missions trip. But it's a presentation of two Gospels and comparing, because we do learn from comparison. It's worth seeing. And then at the end of that, I have a, uh, the Trinity in Chairs, how we view the Trinity and different perspectives. It's worth seeing, but that comes down to what is the gospel? How many of you remember Bruce Walkup, the video of what is the gospel? Okay. There's a brand new series, a reteaching of this, because that was 20 years ago. It's, he's now posting it. He's at number 20, I believe. Uh, I think it's going to be almost 27 or 30 episodes. They're like half hour, 20 minutes each. That's going to be fresh. That's worth looking up and watching. I'll share them eventually. Once they're all out, then I'll share the post with all of you. But some of you that are already connected, go look, because it's, it's good. Oh, my goodness. Jesus' understanding of forgiveness was so radical because he did not need people to repent before he accepted them. Pause there. That's a shocker. Let me read that again. Jesus' understanding of forgiveness was so radical because he did not need people to repent before he accepted them. He did not require a change in behavior before he loved, respected, and related to them. Yet, it was precisely this unconditional love and forgiveness that seemed so potent and transformative, often being the very act that drew people to repentance. This, I think, is a key in unlocking what unconditional love can look like. I have not mastered it. I'm looking at it carefully. Sometimes I step over the lock. I'm practicing. I don't get, always get it right. I'm, I don't know when I'll ever get it right. But that, to me, is so powerful. I hope you just, if you, in fact, if you need a meditation this coming week, read that every day this coming week a couple times. Just, wow, what could this mean? I think I have one or two more. No, this is the last one, I think. Tony Campolo. Jesus never says to the poor, come find the church. But he says to those of us in the church, go to the world and find the poor, hungry, homeless, and imprisoned. And lastly, I did not come to teach you. I came to love you, and love will teach you. This ties into the green slide of what love can look like. This is a whole generation. Son, sorry, father, son, grandfather. So, What is love? Love will teach. Not your words, not your theology. That's what's hard for me because I'm so theologized in my upbringing and churchianity and Bible college and seminaries and courses and you name it. And I, I, sometimes I wonder if that is actually a distraction from truth because now I'm told what something means, but now I'm finding that they actually are a wealth of history and information for me. I don't have to mock them. I don't have to say that's wrong, this one's right. It's a collection now that's exposed exploring and expanding the mystery of God's love for us. It was true for me for a period of time. But then, who brings you to the next growth spurt? The Holy Spirit. And you can't push somebody else to grow. So we need to be gentle and loving in how we disagree. And most of the time, you just need to be quiet, not disagree. Because it's probably the most unloving thing you can do is to disagree just to be right. Yeah, that's all I'll say. But that idea of love will teach you, as I said last week or the week before, when we know we are loved, 
when we love ourselves like God loves us, which could take the rest of our lives, that love will transform us from the inside out. We will become loving people. Your new defaults are going to change. You're going to start to see your reactions change from, yeah, but, to, huh, yeah, but, or, huh, I have more to learn. (laughs) There's a journey of unlearning and learning that's beautiful, and only the Holy Spirit gently draws us to himself. Living loved. So today I have a short devotional from Brian Zond. This one kind of blew me away. It was going to be one of the pause and ponderings, but I thought, no, no, no. Instead of a Henry Nowen one, I want to share this with you. It, it, I hope it hits you. I don't know how to explain what hit me, but it's deep. You ready? Well, whether you're not ready or not, here we go. <laughs> All things created by Christ for Christ. That's the, well, that wasn't his title. That's my title because it was a Twitter feed that he had. Paul, in his high Christology, says that all things were created by Christ and for Christ. We've taught this here over and over and over and over. Okay? It's right from Colossians. And Christ is not, oops, typo, absent, and no absent, oh, he is no absent clockmaker. He doesn't make the clock and then move on and on with the next thing. Okay? Christian theology says that the creator Christ is forever bound to the cosmos through his incarnation, an incarnation that is entire salvific. <laughs> I never used that word before, but salvation is included in all that. The cosmos cannot help but be saved because Christ is the savior and creator of the cosmos. Paul says that Christ holds all things together. We've taught that many times. The Hebrew, the writer of Hebrews is like this. He sustains all things by his powerful word. Every star, every galaxy, every blade of grass, every grain of sand is sustained by the word of Christ. Lastly, every created thing will in its final end, reach its final telos, which means it's the ancient Greek word for an end, fulfillment, completion, goal, or aim, because it is created by and for Christ. Every created thing will in its final end reach the final telos because it's created by and for Christ. Christ does not create superfluously or futilely. Creation will become what Christ created it for, Creation will become what Christ created it for. There's something hope-filled in this quote. Look back here for a second. Every star, galaxy, every blade of grass, every grain of sand is sustained by the word of Christ. Are you created? Me too. We too are sustained by the word of Christ. If it's easy to believe these objects are all held together by Christ and flowers and trees and sky and stars, that's lovely, but we never include ourselves in that or other people. Why? Because we have so much of an us versus them mentality. Well, they're clearly not in. They're being held together too. Love wins. I don't know. That just kind of blew me away. I just saw it like two days ago. I was like, oh my goodness. This says so much in so few words. Anyway, I hope it hits you. Let's get into this. God loves you. Reminders. Let's be reminded. That's what I want to do for a couple of these slides. No big, heavy, deep sermon today. I just want to share what the scriptures say about you and I being loved We don't hear it enough. Like, do you remember children, if they keep getting yelled at and yelled at, they keep doing things bad, can't measure up, they build this shame and bad complex and all kinds of problems come from that. All because of the negative voices we send into children. Oh, and we do that with adults. Oh, and that happens between spouses. When there's a pattern of negative, negative words and harshness, it 
becomes a, a false truth that they believe. It's not real. So we need to see the other side and make that the message. We are loved, valued, and accepted, and repeat this over and over and over. And I want you to hear that from the scriptures. Oh my goodness, never thought I'd come up with this one. Hey, you, you, did you think that was coming? All right. I love this one. New Living Translation. For this is how God loved believers. Oh, that's not what it says. Hang on, let me try again. For this is how God loved those who went to church. Huh, no, doesn't say that either. For this is how God loved those who said the right prayer. Huh, no. See where I'm going? This is how God loved the world. God loves everybody, even the people you can't stand. And in a politically charged culture, that's hard to remember. Oh, wait, you are not a politically charged person. You may act like it sometimes. That is not your identity. Your identity comes from your source. You are a loving person. We get contaminated with worldly thoughts and systems and patterns and philosophies. But Christ in you is your source, is your life, is your light. He gave his one and only son so that everyone who believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. And by the way, eternal life is not something you get when you die, which is what I grew up believing. And I preached for many years. If you do this, then this can happen. But you also got to act correctly just to maintain your salvation. Otherwise, you could be out. That's what I grew up with. It's false. It's, it, 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 it plays into fear and shame like you would not believe. That unlearning is so difficult. But eternal life is Jesus in you. It's waking up to the fact that your source is Jesus. Oh, yeah, then verse 2. You see, everybody loves... John 3.16, but they leave out John 17 more than ever. God did not send his son into the world, not to judge the world, but to save the world through him. We are professional judges in our Western society of Christianity religion, not, not Christ, but our system of religion. We're professional judges. And unlearning that's been hard. I'm still unlearning, and I love it. Let's read from another translation. First Nations Version. If you haven't got this Bible, this is worth looking up. Get it on Kindle. I love this translation. It's a great devotional translation. I promise you that. The Great Spirit loves this world of human beings so deeply that he gave us his son, the only son, who fully represents him. All who trust in him and his way will not come to a bad end, but will have the life of the world to come that never fades away, full of beauty and harmony. Creator did not send his son to decide against the people of this world, but to set them free from the worthless ways of the world. Now that's good. Let me go back for a second because I love this one line. The son who fully represents him. We've covered this a lot over the last couple of years. Jesus came as the perfect representation of his father. Why would he need to do that? Because the world had a false concept of his father. Jesus dealt with it through, through his whole time on earth. His whole time of ministry, when he got in fights with the religious people, is because they were misrepresenting his father misquoting, misreading, misinterpreting those texts that they call sacred. And Jesus comes and he is the representative. Whatever is true of Jesus is true of his Father. When you see that and believe that, now go back in the Old Testament and go, oh, there's some incomplete representations here. Jesus is the representation. He's got the correct answer. 1 John 4, 7. Dear friends, let us love one another, for love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. 
Love comes from where? From God. You can't source it. You can't make it up. I gotta love that person more. No, you don't. Some rule says you do, but the rule that should be listened to is the one, the law, the spirit of Christ in you. That's who we listen to. Because if you're looking at a paper rule that says you must love, because it's there, you mean that's tutor material. We need to love because we are love, Christ in us. It's our natural disposition. When we don't love others, it's not natural. We're hypocrites. Some people think you're a hypocrite when you're not acting like how you feel. It's the exact opposite. When you're not acting like who your identity is, that's hypocrisy. How you feel is irrelevant. I can love James and not feel like it in the moment because he just hit a home run. It's like, you know. That'd be nice. I know. <laughs> You've had some good hits lately. But the idea of me not feeling like being happy or loving him, but I still high five him because it's, it's correct. I am adjusting my actions with truth, not my feelings. Do you hear the difference? There's a huge difference there. I love that. Romans 5 8 says, But God demonstrates his own love for us. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Do you see that again? His own love for us. You are loved. Your behavior does not affect or infect the love of God in any way. Does that mean you can keep on sinning and God still loves you? Yes. Oh, cool. All right. I'm free. I can do all that. That's so immature. That's so religious bound following rules mentality. When you really know who love is and, and how much you're loved, the desire to not even want to do half that stuff is going to start to take over and it's going to purge out those things that aren't really you anyway and let love run its course in you. John 3, 34 says, A new command I give to you. Love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. I saw this T-shirt, and in fact, I bought it. Um, but somebody posted in one of the groups I'm in um, and posted a picture of the T-shirt. And oh my goodness, it was lambasted by it. Because it was in a, a group of, I think it was a comedy group even. Christian comedy. Christian comedy. Oh my goodness. I get some pretty funny memes out there. However, this was memed into there. And it says, love your neighbor, love your Muslim neighbor, love your LGBTQ neighbor, love your... And the list went on, and then the last line was blank. And the religious vitriol against that was unbelievable. Well, how come we can't love that person? What about... Because it was also political, someone of a different political party. <laughs> so you can imagine which country was really raging on that one. But really... I couldn't believe how people were offended by that because you know, Jesus said to love everyone. Well, where does it say that? Like, honestly, people asked, thinking, you can't give me an easier way to answer. Boom. Love your enemies even comes up. Oh, my goodness. We covered uh, one slide last week. If I, have, if I have time, I'll show that slide today. But love is our default. If you think your other behaviors are your default, that's a misunderstanding, and it's time to correct that thinking, which is called we need to renew our minds. And I think we do that by studying, believing, hearing the love of God towards us. It's not by some rule book or 20-step plan. If you need a 12-step plan to help you out of a pattern, use it. God uses that stuff. Don't mock it either. John 13, 34 says, A new command I give you, love one another as I have loved you, so you must love one another. Shoot, did you catch that as I have loved you? That's a really big qualification. There is no wiggle room. There's no loophole, which I'm really good at finding. No loophole. Love one another. 
It means that, literally. There's no secret meaning here. It means love one another. And what happens for the people you don't like, you can still be loving, you find out you've been judging them. That's why you're having a hard time with them. I'm also going to qualify this. This is a generic statement. I'm going to be very careful because I can hear thoughts. What about this? What about that? What about this? There are times the loving thing to do is to distance and cut off people. It's a fact. Because it's so toxic, you need to heal. And that's very loving. But if I'm a good Christian, I need to accept and do all that. Like, okay. I understand how that can play into this. But stop thinking about all the big, big, big ones and begin with you and the people really close and just begin. Don't worry about those really big categories because the Holy Spirit will be your guide and wisdom when it comes to that time. It may, it may take years. It's, this is a really tough topic, but it's real. 1 Corinthians 13, and these three things remain, faith, hope, and love, but the greatest of these is love. And this is right after, love is patient, love is kind, love does not envy, love is not irritable. I was at a wedding yesterday, reading that text, and the couple's standing there looking at each other, oh, love you, oh, it's pretty good, you know. And, uh, you know, I do, yeah, and all that stuff. And then I read that love is patient, love is kind, I get to, love is not irritable, <clears throat> it was really funny. Yeah. And then I emphasized the love keeps no record of wrongs. Hint, hint. It was just fun. You know, this is not a, not a religious couple. In fact, I introduced that text as an ancient Greek text. It worked. But after the, and by the way, that list is not a to-do list, which is what we've been given as a church. You must be patient. You must, you know, this. You must be not irritable. You must. As soon as somebody turns that on you, they are not acting from love. This is for you and your soul. Here's what I get to do. Here's what love looks like. Because if somebody says they love you, and they're not acting like that little list, to me, that, that is not love if they're being harmful, abusive. That's not love. But I love you. Well, your definition of love is really screwed up. Because I think agape, the definition of agape, is the most accurate, most foundational word that describes love. Others-centered. And then you read 1 Corinthians 13. This is what other-centered love looks like. So in a marriage, it's never supposed to be 50-50, which is what people think. It's 100-100. There's a big difference here. This should be, the only competition you should have in a marriage is who can outserve and outlove the other. 1 John 4, 19, we love because he first loved us. And if you don't know, he loves you. And if you only have it as a compartment in your brain, okay, I see the Bible verse, yep, I believe the Bible verse, but does your soul, heart, and mind Believe it. Do you know it to be true? And here's an example of believing and knowing. There's a difference. I remember B.J. Thomas uh, telling a story on an old record. This is when I was a kid. That's how old the story is. But about the professional marshmallow roaster. How many have heard of the professional marshmallow roaster? He takes you know a bunch of city kids to, to the, out camping, and they've never seen a fire before, a campfire, let alone marshmallows, marshmallow sticks and everything. Well, this is a professional marshmallow roaster because he pulls out his cue and screws it together, you know. He's got like three or four parts to it with the tip so he can roast marshmallows. Like this is, and he's got a little clip, you know, with the marshmallows ready to go. And man, he, and he's teaching his kids about marshmallows. So each of the kids has a marshmallow around this fire. Oh, they're loving this, the experience, the sounds and all that stuff. And suddenly one kid's marshmallow catches fire, boom, and falls into the fire. The kid reaches in to go get it. No, 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 don't touch. Bernie, Bernie, hot. Whoa, no, no, don't do that. Oh, okay, I believe you. He believed him. Well, you know what, that little pack, the professional pack on his belt grew empty of marshmallows, so he had to go refill it, so he went back to his bag to refill. But in the meantime, 
That kid lost another marshmallow in the fire, and he went in to reach it and grab it. He thought, if I'm just quick enough. He instantly went from believing to knowing. Believing and knowing. Do you believe God loves you? There can be an essence, uh, a circumference concept of the love of God. But do you know the love of God? And only you can answer that deep within your soul. It's already answering it for you. If you need to know more and want to believe that more, know that more, the Holy Spirit hears that cry and will draw you into deeper belief and knowing. It's not your call. We love because he first loved us. John 15, 9 to 10. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my house, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. Oops. As the Father has loved me. So Jesus is modeling how to live loved. As he lived loved, he's screaming love to them. Now live loved. I'm modeling this for you. If you keep my commandments, and by the way, what commandments did he sum the whole law? As in all of the law. What were the commandments? Do you remember? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind. And that was not a wagging finger law. You love the Lord your God with all your heart and mind or else. That's how we hear it in some places. I'm not kidding. It's more of love. The Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your mind. It's so exciting. Oh, and love your neighbor as yourself. We don't hear that last part very well. We hear the love your neighbor, but as yourself. Let me say it slower. Love your neighbor as yourself. As yourself as if it's you that's different love your neighbor as if it's you but if you don't love yourself oh my goodness you're going to treat them from your insecurities and hurts and pains and we need healing from that love your neighbor as yourself oh my goodness that that one's deep all right Ephesians 2, 4, 5. But God being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us. Are you starting to get the picture you're loved? Huh. Even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ, by grace you have been saved. This love happened before you prayed the prayer. This love happened before you were baptized. This love happened before you entered a church or tent meeting, or camp fire ministry thing. This love happened before you believed. In order for a person to believe, where does the belief begin? In us. I was blown away 20 years ago when I was studying some systematic theology, and a very conservative theologian wrote a textbook, I won't tell you which one, systematic theology, but there's a whole ton of authors of different books. I was stunned to find where belief comes in salvation. And this, this particular person, to, I, I just can't believe it was there. I wonder if they even knew it. <laughs> belief comes from within. You can't say the prayer if there isn't a light already in you allowing you to believe. Because you can't pray in spirit. That's impossible. Spirit within you illuminates and wakes you up and you believe. Now Brian Zahn's devotional suddenly clicks. Wait, we're created by Christ. That's our goal. That's our origin. We're predestined to be like Christ already. Wow. Long before, while we were dead in our trespass, when we were blind in our mind, Romans 8, 37, 39. No, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who, what? Loved us. 
For I am sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. Another translation says that is revealed in Christ Jesus. Nothing can separate us from the love of God. Try coming up with even one thing, and it's wrong. Yeah, that idea too. And that one. Nope. Nice try. I can hear you thinking. Just kidding. (laughs) This is a big one. This will mess up your sleep if you start thinking like this at night. Or it can bring you to a place of peace going, oh my goodness. I am baptized in love. John 15, 9 says, As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Abide in my love. Romans 12, 10 says, Love one another with brotherly affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. Oh my, did you just hear that? Outdo each other after showing one another in showing honor? Outserve one another. How many times do we expect to be served? Yes, you can come serve me. Yes. Uh, thank you for cleaning up. Thanks for setting up. Uh, thank you. Thanks for that thing. Yes, yes, yes. Bring me that. Thank you. Believers, may I say to the in Christ who are aware of in Christ, we're to love one another all the time. Praying for your enemies. I'm going to reread this. This is huge. Now in the context of love, I'm going to read this. Praying for your enemies does not mean you pray that God will make them ultimately come into agreement with your specific way of thinking sometime ahead. It's actually the exact opposite. We pray for enemies to be blessed without any threat of condemnation or any kind of stress attached. We pray for God's grace to help us better see from their seemingly broken perspectives. No matter how opposing it is from yours, We pray for this here and now. We do this so we might speak of them and to them with an overflowing compassion and total forgiveness, desiring to know why they are the way they are, loving them with zero expectation of change to meet us first. Ouch! We pray for our enemies with deep authenticity and a relentless hope for unity and joy to be known and experienced by all in the fullness of time. You can't do this. I cannot do this. Then why'd you put it up there? Make us feel good about ourselves? Jesus does this. In his time, I'm just showing you what it can look like. So that when you begin to experience it, you go, where'd that come from? Where'd that sense of compassion come from? Jesus, that was cool. I did not create that. I know. (laughs) <laughs> it's in you. I want to show you a three-minute clip of somebody telling a story of a chaplain in a hospital and what love can do. Here we go. Um, the last story I'll tell you is about a friend of mine who is a prison, not a prison, he's a, a hospital chaplain. And he goes around, you know, chatting to people who are, who are in hospital beds. And there was one guy who was in for a long time. And he said, every time he walked past the bed, the guy would be in bed. And he'd just do that, that, at the, the vicar as he went past. Every time. Wee. Wee. Oh, there he is. All the time. So he'd go in there. And he got used to it. He just got used to that. So every time he, he usually didn't, but he'd just smile and expect that. And then one particular day, he walked past. And there was no that. He was just lying there. And as he was walking past, he said, Oi. My friend looked at him and said, Yes. And he said, Can I have a word? He said, Sure. He said, All right, I'm not being rude and everything, but you know, um, I would just love to chat to you about what, you know, why you wear that white thing, what you believe. He said, Sure. You know, what, what, what would you like to know? He said, Well, come on then, tell me. So he told him. He told him about Jesus. He told him about grace, about forgiveness, about the love of God, about the relationship you can have with him, all the basic things and that you can pray to him. And he said, well, how do you pray then? He said, well, it's pretty simple actually. He said, well, how do you pray then? And he said, well, and he got off his chair and said, okay, that's your bed, there you are, there's a chair. Now you just imagine that Jesus is sitting in this chair and he's, he's just loving you permanently. He knows you. 
And you can talk to him, so you can just say what you like. He said, so what would you say? And he said, I'd probably say that I'm pretty scared. Well, you can tell him that. Very fragile man. And he said, well, what else would you say? And that I've effed up my life and I'm sorry. Great, that's honest. What else would you say to know? Well, you can be in silence, but just remember he's there. Just keep talking, keep talking. You can listen if you like, but just keep talking. Remember that you're loved. Remember that he died for you. Remember that you're free. Basic stuff. So he said, thanks. I can see why you're a vicar. Sounds good. And then he, and my friend got up and left. He was there a few days later, walked past the bed, empty. Spoke to the nurses, where is he? have you moved him to another ward? No, I'm afraid. The nurse, staff nurse said, no, I'm afraid he died actually two days after you were last here. And he went, oh, okay. And um, he said, that's a shame. And she said, yeah, but you know, when you left the last time, he was all really, <laughs> he was kind of bouncy in bed and kept telling us what you told him about the chair and this Jesus thing. And uh, he said, oh, that's good. And she said, he said, yeah, he was like really overwhelmingly kind of pleased about it all. Um, and he said, good. And, and then he got a bit sort of, you know, so he started walking off. And the, char- the staff nurse said, oh, by the way, one other thing b- before um, you go, you, you should probably know, and it's a bit strange to tell you this, but I'm going to tell you anyway, that when we found him in the morning after he died, he was found leaning out of his bed. His hips were on the bed and his chest was on the, he pulled the chair, to, his chest was on the chair and his arms were wrapped around the back of the chair. And he died like that. And of course, my friend just started weeping because um, cause he, he realized that this guy, he, he'd understood the whole thing. He got it completely in a nutshell. The thing we struggle with all our lives, he'd understood that he was loved. The reason why he exists was because it was to love and be loved and that he could rest his whole weight and his fragility on this Jesus because you can put your burden on him and he will sustain you because he loves you. About that, live to be loved. <clears throat> you want to simplify the gospel? That's a pretty good way to do it. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, can you make the reality of you loving us stronger than just believing it? Will you do the work in us so we actually know it and that we may grow in our confidence of that fact, especially when we're having hard times even believing because some of us don't even love ourselves right now. Father, the part we don't love about ourselves are all the mistakes, but the mistakes are not who we are. You in us is who we are. Help us to shift our thinking. Be the one who does the work of shifting our thinking. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.